Scripture reading this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It's 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Please be seated. got a simple goal uh, for our lesson this morning. For those of you who are, uh, who are married, uh, the lesson is designed to encourage you, as you see projected before you, uh, to protect your marriage from outside threats, uh, to provide some, some tools to help you, uh, to, to protect your marriage from the devastating consequences of an affair. Now, you, you may say, well, Tim, that's, that's come out of nowhere. What, what are you talking about? A lot of people, one of the biggest problems, I'll repeat this again later, one of the, one of the biggest problems in, in some marriages, and I think some of the marriages, especially in a gathering like this, is that we believe that we're safe from the things that have happened to other people. We've seen other people destroy their marriage, their family, their faith, and we think that what happened to them can't happen to us. One of the best ways to protect your marriage to, is to understand that you are not invincible. It's to understand that you are as vulnerable as others. Now, there's things we can do to protect ourselves. The things we can do to strengthen our marriage. I want you to think this morning, this is the main thought from Scripture this morning. It's Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Now let, let that settle down. This is God speaking. It's not my opinion. It's, it's not a thought I came up with. Here's what God wants. Let marriage be held in honor by all. I, I don't think that's happening in our culture. If there, if there was a time in the past when that was the case, I don't think that you could say that, that people in our culture have an attitude that marriage is honored by all. That's what God wants. He says, let the marriage bed be undefiled. And then he goes on to give this warning, God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. We're going to talk about some difficult things this morning, some important things. Be sober-minded, be, be alert, be on your guard. The, the devil is like a roaring Lion, he's seeking whom he might devour. We, we've got to be vigilant people. We, we, we've got to be people who don't fall asleep. We've got to be alert. We've got to be aware. We, we've got to understand how the devil works and the things that he, he does to get into our lives. Not just to separate our relationship, separate us from our relationship with God, but he, he does that same thing uh, in some of the more intimate relationships we have with each other, especially in our marriages. An affair not only defiles the marriage bed, it dishonors the very institution of marriage. You can't justify infidelity. I know that this is so obvious that it probably doesn't need to be stated, and yet I hope you'll take this to heart. God will never bring you someone else's spouse as an answer to your prayer. You say, well, Tim, I'm so lonely, and I'm so unhappy, and this person is, this is the exact person that I've always wanted, the companionship, the intimacy, and I've found it. This is God's answer. God's answer to your loneliness and unhappiness is not somebody else's spouse, and it never will be. Never. God wants you to be faithful to the person you marry. He wants you to experience joy and fulfillment in your marriage. I want you to think about some ways that we can be unfaithful in our relationship to our spouse. You can be physically unfaithful. 
Now, everybody understands physical cheating happens when you're involved sexually with someone other than your spouse. People have all kinds of words or, or phrases. It's an affair. It's a fling. It, it, sleeping around, hooking up. Listen, it's cheating. It's infidelity. It's adultery. It's wrong. There's no excuse for it. it. It doesn't matter how Hollywood tries to make it look like this romantic. It is a sin against God. It is a sin against your spouse. It is, listen, the, the Bible says that there's, there's no other sin like sexual sin. It's a sin against your own body. Which is, by the way, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's no excuse. Regardless of how unhappy you might be in your own marriage, you can be mentally unfaithful. Mental cheating happens when a married person reads, listens to, or watches pornography. It is a perverse intrusion into your marriage relationship. It is insulting. It is disloyal. It is wrong. Viewing pornography makes your spouse feel ugly and hurt and inadequate. Mental affairs need to stop because they erode trust and intimacy in your marriage. They create unfair comparisons. They create unrealistic expectations that will destroy your marriage. So some of us look at those two and say, well, we've heard of that. I mean, yeah, physical and mental, but... Listen, there's another form I want you to think about this morning. You can be emotionally unfaithful. Emotional cheating is when you've made an unhealthy friendship with someone of the opposite sex. You become attached to that person and formed a bond with them that should only exist between you and your spouse. You constantly text talk to or want to spend time together with this person you hide this relationship and the details of it from your spouse why, why would you hide it you're hiding it because you know it's wrong emotional affairs are just as dangerous and just as wrong as physical and mental affairs they, they need to end because this emotional attachment is how most physical affairs get started. They, they begin with an unhealthy, ill-advised friendship with a person of the opposite sex. These deep emotional bonds open the door to physical intimacy. There's a district court judge in Texas who, who said he believes that nearly 98% of the people that appear in his courtroom for a divorce, nearly 98% of them are already carrying on a relationship with someone else through texting. They've already started a relationship with someone else through texting even before the divorce is final. Some of you might, might think of this. You, you'll see all the social you know, media, all, all the different things up there and think, Tim, you're making uh, too, too big a deal out of this. This is so harmless and you're, you're overreacting. I want to tell you outside threats to your marriage are real. They're real. They're dangerous. As a church, all, all of us need to take this threat seriously. I, I don't know if the pandemic has created stress fracture, stress fractures in marriages, or if it's just revealed them. You, you understand what I'm saying? I, I don't know if all of the things that are happening all the time now that we have to spend together is, is causing stress on our relationships or if it's just revealing that the problem has been there all along but, but our busy lives have been a buffer and, and, it, and it has kind of covered up the problem and now that everything's slowed down, sent us home and we have to deal with each other, now we can't ignore the fact that in some of our marriages we've got a real problem. What are we going to do? How, how do you protect yourself from these threats? Here are three ideas I want you to consider. Number one, remove or disable any security features that limit access to your digital devices. Almost all of us have cell phones. I, I love it. I, I love technology, all the great things that, that have come into our lives. I don't remember anything anymore. I mean, I don't have to. I just Google it, right? I mean, the convenience of it, there, there are a lot of wonderful things about technology, but listen, you can't deny that technology is also open to the door some real, to some really dangerous things, and, and given those things free access into our lives, 
They come right in to our home, into our living room, into our bedroom. If you haven't already done so, I hope the first thing you do when you get home this afternoon is set up all of your digital devices so that both you and your spouse have, have access, unrestricted access to them. So, some of you may not like that. But I really want to encourage you when you go home to make that decision that you and your spouse have unrestricted access to every phone, iPad, laptop, I don't care what it is. Nothing should be off limits. There should be no secrets. Nothing should be hidden. Your spouse should be able to pick up your phone and use it. Scroll through. Look at the history. I'm telling you this morning, this kind of transparency, this kind of accountability is a safeguard that can protect your marriage from outside threats. It can protect your marriage and it can keep your marriage safe. There shouldn't be anything on my phone or on my computer, iPad, that my wife can't see. There shouldn't be anything on your phone, on your laptop, on your iPad that your spouse can't see. When I, when I say remove security features, uh, you, your, your computer may need to have a security feature, but your spouse should know what it is. I think even my kids know how to get into my phone. Now they put something on my phone, they know where I am all the time too, which I don't think they need to know when I'm getting donuts. I don't really think that's anybody else's business but my own. But Number two, carefully avoid monitor friendships with the opposite sex. I think you understand that, that most people don't wake up one morning and say, I think today I'm going to start an affair. That's, that's ridiculous. That's not how an affair begins. Affairs develop gradually, almost always in the context of friendship. There's a scenario that, that, that I want you to consider, and you say, well, Tim, you're just making this up. No, listen, this is, this is real life. What, what I'm about to describe happens all the time it's happening more often than it used to and we need to guard ourselves against something like this what, what, what are we talking about we're talking about something that presents a really serious threat to the sanctity and the security of your marriage at the beginning it seems so innocent it's a it's a text message to someone of the opposite sex someone other than your spouse. You're, you're just sharing information. Look, it could be with somebody who goes to, goes to church with you. It could be a, another parent that, you know, you're communicating about things, you know, between your kids, things that are going on, activities, events at school. It could be somebody that you work with. It's just an innocent text message. That first exchange grows into something more. The two you start texting once or twice a week. You start getting excited when the phone dings and you look down and you realize who's texting. You start looking forward to hearing from that person. You get excited to receive one of those messages. The weekly contact gradually becomes daily. You start checking in with each other every day. Next thing you know, you are so deep into this thing. You're texting all day, every day, late at night, even after your spouse goes to bed. If you're involved in a relationship like the one I just described, you're, you're not headed towards cheating. You're already there. If you get a message on your phone and you can't read it in front of your spouse, you've got to go to another room. You've got to step away because you don't want him to see the message or you don't want her to see who's texting you. You're not headed for a problem. You already have a problem. What I'm describing this morning, some people, and when I say naive, I've preached lessons like this before, and members of this congregation have actually come up to me and said, do you think something like that could happen here if it happens to others, what, what makes you think it couldn't happen to any of us? 
Things that have happened can happen. This has happened. It can happen. One of the biggest mistakes married people make is believing that couldn't happen to us. What I just described can happen to anyone. It's why we need to be so important and we need to be so careful about establishing guidelines or ground rules. Here are a couple that I want you to consider this morning. Number one, don't spend too much time on social media. Staying up late at night on social media after your spouse goes to sleep is probably not a good idea. How much time is too much time? When you're, when you're ignoring the people that are physically present with you in the room to talk to somebody on Facebook, somebody on the other side of the world, when you're paying more attention to your social media relationships than you are to the relationships with the people that you live with, that's too much time. That, that's, that's too much. Never accept a friend request that makes your spouse uncomfortable. Tawny is my best friend. There's never, there's never going to be another person that I'm going to call my best friend. I got one best friend. Your, your husband, your wife should be your best friend. Case closed. Nobody else should have such intimate, intimate access to your heart that friendship with them means more to you than friendship with your own husband or your own wife. They should be the most important person in your world. Their friendship should matter more than, than any friends you have on Facebook, and you, you need to be especially careful about reconnecting with people from your past. You, you, you wouldn't believe this, there, there are people, I'm nearly 50, there are people my age who, who are reconnecting with a, with a high school sweetheart. I mean, it's, it's so silly. I'm going to get on Facebook and go back and, and send a friend request to somebody I, I dated 30 years ago. Do you know that there are people who have left their marriage because of an ill-advised friendship on social media, they reconnected and, and they, they, their first love has come back into their... Isn't that wonderful? It's destroyed their marriage, broken the heart of their children. It's devastating. Be careful. Be careful about accepting or seeking friendship on social media. Unfriend anyone who crosses normal boundaries. You got that little voice in your head. If something tells you this isn't right, it probably isn't right. If someone seems too friendly, too flirtatious, you need to rethink that social media friendship. In some cases, unfriending, blocking that person. It's the best thing you can do. Post pictures of you and your spouse together. It's, it's, just, it's just good to send the message that you enjoy the relationship that you have with your spouse. If people, if people were to go to my page, you, somebody said, well, you can find out what people are passionate about. Just go look at their, some of you, it's hunting and fishing. I just scroll right by that. For, for some, listen, it's basketball, it's, it's sports. Can, can people go to your page and see that you are passionate about, about your marriage? This, this person that I'm married to, I, I want to tell you, she is my favorite person. And, and I want to send that message in all kinds of different ways. I think it's good that she knows that. I, I think it's good that, that everybody else knows I feel that way about my wife. That there's a picture when, when we got married, you know, you, you come in and then, and then the, you know, as you leave, the bride and groom leave first. And somebody got a picture and said, you all just couldn't take your eyes off each other. Does your Facebook page, does your other social media send that message? This person is the delight of my 
heart. She means more to me than anybody else. You can send that message even by posting pictures of the two of you together. Never complain about your marriage on social media. You'd, you'd have to be a fool. I don't know who does that. If you're unhappy in your marriage, complaining about it on Facebook isn't going to solve the problem. It's only going to make it worse. What one of the best things I learned very early on about my relationship with Tani is that when she was upset about something that was going on in our marriage, she didn't talk to her mother, she didn't talk to her sister. It was pretty awkward. She talked right to me. You know who you need to talk to when you're unhappy about something in your marriage? You need to talk to your spouse about that. You don't need to tell the world. You don't need to complain to the world on social media about something that happened in your private world. Somebody says to children, if you don't have anything good to say, don't, don't say anything at all. That, that might be good for adults to take that advice, right? This next one, think before you type. This, this is especially important as we're, as we're thinking about um, as we're thinking about pictures of someone from the opposite sex well you look great well I love that outfit well I love your hairstyle listen can, can I just tell you those are things again that we reserve that, that's between you and your spouse Somebody of the opposite sex gets, gets a new job. They, they put that on Facebook and say, hey, let me tell you about the new job. Hey, congratulations on your job. That's fine. But some of the comments that, that I've seen married men make on Facebook pictures of someone that is not their wife, we just can't be doing those kinds of things. This does not happen to me very often. <laughs> but... Um, We need, to, we need to think through all of these things. I've gotten out of, out of line here, I think, on some of my, on some of my uh, outline. But, but listen, let me, let me run through it again. Don't spend too much time on social media. Never accept a friend request that makes your spouse uncomfortable. Unfriend anyone who crosses normal boundaries. Uh, post pictures of you and your spouse together. Uh, never complain about your marriage on social media. Uh, think before you type. Uh, we've gone through uh, several of those things with rethinking how you engage in social media. We've talked about be, be careful about forming close relationships with the opposite sex. Can we go back to that slide? Sorry. I've got a book out here by Trey and Lee, uh, Lee Morgan. I hope you'll think about getting a copy of that, Ten Ways to a Stronger Marriage. A lot of the ideas I'm sharing in this morning's lesson come from that book. Here, here's their rule for friendship with the opposite sex. Trey said, Lee and I text people with the opposite sex, but only to pass on information, like don't forget the meeting at 6 o'clock tomorrow night. We do not text people with the opposite sex for personal reasons, meaning we don't text the, uh, someone who, that we're not married to to ask things like, how, how was your day? How are you feeling today? How are you doing? Th those are things reserved for married couples. Uh, you might not agree with that rule. You might be offended by it or unwilling to follow it. Let, let me tell you, I'm pleading with you to be cautious about friendships with the opposite sex. We mentioned this. I want to circle back to it. Never confide in someone of the opposite sex about problems that you're having in your marriage. This, this is a classic pattern that people follow. It's a classic mistake that they make that leads them out of their marriage and into an adulterous affair. If you're talking to someone of the opposite sex about unhappiness in your marriage, you're in big trouble. You're already in big trouble. I mentioned this, I'll say it again, the person that you need to be talking to about any kind of dissatisfaction in your marriage is the person that you're married to. Finding sympathy 
with some woman that you work with or some man that you work with about the unhappiness in your marriage relationship is a major red flag. Be careful. Watch for obvious warning signs. You, you find yourself dressing up in hopes that this person will notice you. Or on occasions when you know that your path is going to cross that other person and you're always looking your best in preparation for those encounters. That's a warning sign. You're keeping secrets. You're hiding things from your spouse. If you're hiding it, I know that, I know that everybody understands this. If you're hiding it, you know it's something you shouldn't be doing. If it's innocent, you don't need to hide it. When I say listen to your spouse and respect their concerns, I, I think this is really, really important. If, if they're uncomfortable with a relationship that you have on social media, you, you need to listen to them and you need to respect their concerns. Husbands, if your wife is uncomfortable with a friendship that you have with another woman, you, you need to discontinue that relationship. There's no debate about that. And wives, if your husbands are uncomfortable with a relationship you have with another man, you need to discontinue that relationship. In healthy marriages, uh, mature couples are going to cut off any relationship that threatens the relationship that they have with each other. Let me, let me review. This is so funny. I was reviewing my notes this morning in the office and put my pages back together in the wrong order. <laughs> Remove, disable security features that limit access to digital devices. Your spouse should be able to get into your phone, your laptop, any, any kind of digital device. Carefully avoid or monitor friendships with the opposite sex. Rethink how you engage with others on social media. Those, those are the main thoughts that I wanted to share. At some point, all of us in, in marriage can get into a situation that is, that is difficult. I, I think it can happen to any of us. In, in fact, it can happen to all of us. And you, you may be in a difficult time in your marriage right now this morning. This lesson isn't designed to say, well, Tim talked about physical and uh, mental and emotional cheating, and, I, and I'm looking for a way out. I, I want to encourage you to never give up on your marriage. Just, just think about those three words, never give up. We started with that passage in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 talking about how the devil is a, a prowling lion. He's seeking whom he might devour. He, he would love nothing more than to destroy your marriage. If he can destroy your marriage, he can hurt you. He can hurt your spouse. He can hurt your children, your parents, extended family members, friends, co-workers. Listen, divorce, divorce hurts everybody. And it, and it hurts the local church as well. This is a line that I borrowed from that book from uh, Trey and Lee Morgan. Not every marriage has to end just because there's a reason. I hope those of you who are experiencing a painful season in your marriage will take that to heart. You say, well, Tim, my, my spouse has given me a reason. You know, that there, there are people in, in our church family over, over the, the course of time that they've, they've had a reason to walk away, but they decided to stay. Your marriage doesn't have to end just because you have a reason. You can work through the bitterness. You can work through the anger. You can seek counseling and be patient with the healing process. It takes time. It took time for your marriage to become unhealthy. It'll take time for it to become healthy again. 
One of the beautiful words we have in our relationship with God is the word reconciliation. That, that God in Christ is recon, reconciling man back to himself. It's a beautiful idea that even though God has every reason to walk away from the relationship, He doesn't. He wants to reconcile us even through the death of His Son. In my, in my prayers for some of, the, some of the families that have been hurting in the past, let, let me tell you what I've prayed and we'll conclude here. Ultimately, I'm praying for reconciliation, but that's not where I start. I start praying for accountability. I start praying for the person who has sinned against the marriage and sinned against their marriage partner to take responsibility for the sin that they've committed. You see, I I don't think reconciliation is possible without that step. Even in Scripture, in our relationship with God, should we continue in sin that grace might abound? God forbid. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? When a person comes in the relationship and says, I did wrong, and and owns it, I'm so sorry for what I've done, discontinues the sinful behavior, repents of it, that accountability, that includes confession and repentance. And it starts there makes forgiveness and reconciliation possible. This morning, I I want to invite any of the members of our congregation that need to do that to accept responsibility for the sin that has taken place in your relationship. To confess and to repent so that forgiveness and reconciliation can take place. It's so urgent. It's so important. That the sooner, the sooner you do that, the sooner healing can begin in your relationship. Some may need to come publicly this morning. Some may want to talk privately to an elder, to one of the ministers, or to a close Christian friend. But I pray that if your marriage is... is, being attacked by outside threats that you will do whatever you can as soon as you can to start the healing process. And I believe that our church family is a wonderful place to heal. If you want to come home to the Lord this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.
wanted to remind you, we've got about 50 copies of that book. We want to share good resources that will help strengthen you and your relationships with one another. Uh, they're available out here, uh, right outside the, the office area. Uh, we're selling them at a discounted price uh, of uh, $10 per book. I'd recommend you get two. And, and, you know, husband has a copy, wife have a copy, read it on your own, and then compare some of the notes as you read together. I have been praying all week about the content of that lesson. I think it's so urgent and important. Uh, I hope that uh, as I got a little lost in my presentation of that this morning, that, that you could still draw important thoughts that will help you uh, in your relationships. Protect your marriage from the danger of outside threats. So glad that you're here with us, all of the the people that are watching online. Uh, So grateful for us to be together. Uh, I think I got so rattled from being a priest last week and I just haven't recovered from it. (laughs) 